In 1836, Texas gained its independence from Mexico. The United States recognized Texas as an independent republic, and at this point, the people of this Republic of Texas had to decide, what do we do going forward? Do we remain independent, our own independent country, or do we join with the United States? Well, the people of Texas will have a vote, and they're going to determine we want to be Americans. The vote is never going to even be called in the United States because in order to annex a foreign country, you need two-thirds of the Senate. That's required for a treaty. Martin Van Buren is going to float the idea in front of the Senate, but it's clear that the northern states in particular don't want to annex Texas. There's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of people want to avoid war with Mexico. Uh, U.S. would probably win that war, but it's going to be incredibly costly. A lot of people think that what the people of Texas did was morally wrong. Probably the biggest issue is going to be slavery. These northern states and southern states had maintained this free state, slave state balance up to 1837. And a lot of northerners are concerned that if you put Texas in, this might not only come in as a single state, but because it's so big, it might be coming in as multiple slave states. That would upset the balance in the Senate. So the idea was so contentious, the vote was never taken, forcing Texas to remain as an independent country. So Martin Van Buren, not going to be bringing Texas in. And then the Panic of 1837 hits, Martin Van Buren has other ideas to deal with. 1840, John Tyler, we talked about him before, the man who, uh, without a party, the guy who had run with William Henry Harrison, Harrison dies, he takes over. And then the Whigs determine, hey, you're not doing what we like. They essentially eject him from their party. He'd left the Democrats. He doesn't like the Democrats anyway because uh, they're the party of Jackson. So he's sitting there. He's not getting anything done when he takes over the presidency in 1841. Are you going to let Texas in? Well, Tyler knew the idea was controversial. He knew he was probably not going to get two-thirds of the Senate to agree to it. So he's going to sit on uh, annexation of Texas during his first years as president. So you're Sam Houston. You're going to be in charge of this Republic of Texas, but you know the United States doesn't want you. Essentially, the Republic of Texas had been flirting with the United States. Come over here. Uh, I want you. I want to give you a big kiss, United States. Please let me move into your house. The U.S., no, I'm not, I'm not going to even vote on bringing you in. Well, Sam Houston, uh, he takes over as president of the Republic of Texas. He's going to serve as president uh, two different times, and he's going to be left with this idea, what do we do? Do I try to strengthen Texas as its own independent republic, or do I try to get the United States to pay attention to me? Well, Sam Houston will try to deal with Texas's various problems, this Indian threat, uh, Comanches, Apaches continue to attack, Mexico doesn't recognize Texas independence. They'll just periodically invade occasionally. People will march in. Uh, Mexico marches in twice in 1842, takes Texas citizens hostage, brings them back. Uh, thankfully for the Republic of Texas, they are having their, their own chaos in Mexico, so they can't march an army entirely into Texas. But you got that problem. You have the issue of internal fighting. There's this guy named Mirabu Lamar that's constantly arguing with Houston about the direction of Texas. The Texas government's incredibly in debt. Uh, can't pay, pay off this debt that they went into uh, during the Texas Revolution. And again, S Sam Houston says the answer to this problem is getting into the United States. If we had the American army here, it would keep Mexico out. It would protect us from Apaches and Comanches. But the United States doesn't want us. Well, what Houston is going to de be determined to do is to make the United States jealous to get them to reconsider and get them to annex Texas. So Houston is going to, in 1843, start flirting with the British. So by 1843, the British had become a huge buyer of cotton from the United States. We've talked about these deep south states producing cotton in droves. Uh, Britain gets a little bit of cotton from its other colonies, but it simply doesn't grow as well as it does in these southern states. Problem is, the United States government charges a pretty high tariff on cotton, uh, cotton duties, 
And so Britain is, you know, has got to uh, pay those when the cotton comes in. And, you know, it doesn't like the fact that money that it gives to the United States strength, strengthens the United States. And this is an issue because British Canada, the British are basically wanting to extend to the West Coast. But they think as the United States becomes more and more powerful, this idea is going to be less feasible. So what Sam Houston will start doing is making appeals to Britain. He'll start sending ambassadors over to start uh, basically convincing Britain that Texas wants to be its best buddy. All right, so what Sam Houston will say to the British is, we can grow a lot of cotton here. This is a ton of cotton growing land here. Maybe not as much as these states combined, but pretty close. And if you will buy from us, hey, maybe we'll charge no duties and you're not strengthening the United States, we're probably not going to be growing out to the West Coast, so you don't have to worry about us as a threat to Canada. So why don't we become best buddies? And Sam Houston starts flirting with the idea that if we start selling you this cotton, maybe we'll give up slavery. By this point, the British had started to become uh, hardcore against slavery. Sam Houston says, we're sort of negotiable on slavery. He's lying about that, by the way. Texans are pretty devoted to slavery at this point. But he says, maybe we'll do that. And um, maybe if we start this part partnership, you can use the British Navy to protect us from Mexico. Or maybe you can talk with Mexico and get them to recognize our independence so they stop invading us. So he says to Britain, we'll sell you cheap cotton. We'll maybe get up slavery, give up slavery if you can help us militarily. Or maybe just talk to Mexico and get them to recognize this Rio Grande border as the border of Republic of Texas. Well, this is going to start making the British listen because at this time, Britain is in negotiations with Mexico to purchase this area of California and what's today the North American West. So as we talked about before, the British and United States had agreed in 1818 to jointly occupy this Oregon Territory, both British fur traders from Canada had moved into this region and American fur traders had moved in. And you saw these British and American uh, fur traders, not that many of them, occupying Oregon. And both Britain and the United States basically said, we'll just let these guys handle themselves. Neither of us is going to claim Oregon. Well, in 1843, the British had started to change their mind because they want to get access to this West Coast, and especially down here. Uh, and what they're going to say is, if we can get Oregon, maybe we can purchase this area from San Francisco to the Republic of Texas from Mexico. Mexico, a lot of debt. Some of this debt is owed to British merchants. So the British are going to propose to Mexico, why don't we buy San Francisco? Or essentially, we'll forgive the debts you owe to the British. And what the British are thinking here is, if this happens then we control this area, and then we can basically go against our 1880, 1818 agreement with the United States, and we can also take this Oregon Territory. So we have some fur traders there. Americans have fur traders there. But um, uh, this will, uh, if we purchase San Francisco, this is going to give us all this West Coast region. So in 1843, Britain's negotiating this with Mexico. It's threatening to take Oregon Territory from the United States. And Sam Houston starts flirting with the British and saying, yeah, if you do this, we'll also be your military partner. So what it almost looks like is that the British will get Oregon Territory, they'll get this California area, and they're, they're going to become economic and military partners with the Republic of Texas. So in 1843, the United States, before all this started going down, it looked very reasonable for the United States to expand to the West Coast. Now it's looking like, uh, you know, Mexico's really weak. And basically now it's looking like the British are going to start hemming you in. Their ally Texas here, their purchase from Mexico here, them claiming Oregon territory here. And now you're no longer going to be able to grow and take over North America as a lot of Americans had hoped. So this situation is going to be very disturbing to uh, the United States. And when Sam Houston starts talking to the British, 
it's essentially going to get people in the America, uh, the United States, incredibly worried. Well, the thing is, Sam Houston never really wanted to join Britain. He is basically ki- kissing Britain um, to get the United States jealous. He never really wants to make this economic and military partnership with Britain. He just wants the United States to look over, see the British flirting with them, realize what might happen if they don't annex Texas, uh, what could happen to the United States. And so it's almost this jealousy ploy. So imagine, you know, hey, United States, and flirting with the United States. The United States is ignoring Texas. Well, fine. And then they go off and they kiss Britain. And then uh, now the United States is looking all jealous like at the Republic of Texas because now they're making out with Britain. So that's the situation the United States is going to find itself in in 1843 going into 1844. Well, John Tyler, this man without a party, you know, he hasn't accomplished anything during his presidency. So took over in 1841. Whigs had rejected him. Democrats had uh, rejected him. He is about to leave office. Neither of the parties are going to nominate him for their candidacy in 1844. He's going to try to introduce uh, annexing Texas into the Senate. The first vote's going to be held, and he's going to find it's split exactly down the middle uh, based on uh, party lines. So uh, basically, Northerners, Whigs say, we don't want to annex Texas. And then Southerners are going to say, uh, we do want to annex Texas, and you need two-thirds in the Senate, so it's not going to go through. Well, the, John Tyler's going to have to basically snap his fingers, I'm not going to let this happen, or uh, I have to let, I'm have not going to be able to get this through. Well, you have Texas sitting there looking like it's going to the British, and this is going to potentially be a major issue going into the 1844 presidential election so as we talked about uh, martin van buren you know the protege of jackson had lost the election in 1840 1840 to uh, uh william henry harrison who had died john tyler had taken over uh and then now you john tyler's a man without a party so he had uh, democrat uh, martin van buren wants to regain the presidency in 1844, um, and he's going to be running against Henry Clay. So Henry Clay at this point uh, had been this Whig party. He'd first ran for the presidency 1824, you know, and, and had uh, lost and then became Secretary of State. He'd run again in 1832. Uh, he'd lost, then he'd formed this Whig party, uh, and, and now he's going to, or not 1832, 1836, and uh, he'd lost. Now he's going to be sitting here looking at John Tyler. The Whigs won, but John Tyler's not doing what he wants. Well, in 1844, Henry Clay is going to determine, I'm going to be the Whig candidate because I want to get through my American system. I want to get the bank up and running again, and I want to um, start putting national funds to internal improvements, uh, and uh, I want to increase the tariff to promote American manufacturing. So the Whigs will nominate Henry Clay as their candidate in 1844, and it looks like the Democrats are about to nominate Martin Van Buren as their candidate. Before they do, however, Henry Clay and Martin Van Buren are going to meet in secret. These two guys, while they belong to different parties, are friends. You know, sometimes you have that, uh, you know, people that will disagree politically, but they're civil uh, when meeting socially. And these guys are going to meet up, and they're going to discuss a common campaign and you know, Henry Clay is going to say, I'm going to be the Whig candidate, Marty, Marty, uh, you know, I'm assuming you're going to be the Democrat candidate. You know, I'm planning to run this way, blah, blah, blah. Well, Martin Van Buren and Henry Clay are going to say, well, what, what are you thinking about Texas? And Henry Clay's like, dude, I don't know what to think about it because this thing is divisive. You know, Northerners don't seem to want it. Uh, Southerners do seem to want it. But the thing is falling down these sectional lines I don't even think we should talk about it in the campaign. Martin Van Buren's going to say, dude, I don't think we should talk about it either. So when I get nomination, I won't talk about it. You won't talk about it. We'll just completely run on different issues. We'll talk about the tariff. We'll talk about the bank, that kind of thing. Henry Clay's like, deal. And these guys secretly uh, decide to uh, not talk about annexation of Texas in the 1844 presidential campaign. Well, word is going to leak to the press of this deal they made, and this is going to upset 
Martin Van Buren's boss, I guess, the head of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, Andrew Jackson. By this point, Jackson's old. He's incredibly frail. But Jackson, he loves the idea of American expansion, and he sees Texas as needing to come into the Union, and he is incredibly upset that Van Buren has made this deal with Henry Clay. He thinks it's basically a betrayal of the United States. You know, we need to annex Texas or the British are going to get their hands on it. So we need to do this uh, uh, or else. And when he hears Van Buren's made this deal, Jackson will go to his party and say, don't nominate Van Buren. He basically turns on Van Buren and says, I don't even really want this guy as a part of the Democratic Party anymore. Nominate someone else and nominate someone that is going to get Texas into the union. Well, at the Democratic nominating convention where the Democrats pick their candidate for president, they're going to pick this guy right here. This guy's name's James K. Polk. James K. Polk will say, if you nominate me, I will annex Texas. I don't care if it means war with Mexico. Texas should be a part of the United States. The fact that, that people are ignoring this is ridiculous. We need to expand the United States, and it's our right to expand the United States. He actually sells it as a responsibility to uh, promote democracy and Republican government into the West. So he's going to make this a major uh, a part of his campaign, and he's going to start bringing forth this imagery we get with westward expansion. It's our responsibility to annex Texas. But Polk knows that Northerners are concerned about adding uh, slave states to the Union. So Polk will say, in addition to annexing Texas, we'll also annex Oregon Territory. So the British are currently threatening to take this over. Forget that. We're going to beat them to it. He will say, we're going to march the United States Army in here, and we're going to take 54, 40, or fight. Basically, this is the longitude and latitude uh, that he wants to take. This is all the way up to Alaska, by the way. This map doesn't show it. But we're going to go in there, and if we have to fight the British, we'll fight the British. So we'll fight Mexico for Texas recognition, and we'll fight Oregon, uh, Britain for Oregon uh, to take Oregon. And so northern states will get new uh, free states out of this. Uh, southern states will get new uh, slave states out of this. And this will maintain the balance. And he's going to throw in for good measure. You know where else I'm going to take? California. And he's going to say this whole area, we're going to take this also because we as the United States need to expand. So this will keep the British out of our backyard. I mean, they'll still be up here in Canada, but uh, we'll basically take the West Coast in its entirety. And down here, uh, we'll take this area from Mexico. So he makes this a huge, huge thing. We're going to take Texas, take Oregon, and uh, somehow get California from Mexico, either whether fighting or buying or whatever, we're going to control the West Coast. Well, the United States listens to these two candidates. They've got James K. Polk talking about war, uh, but he's also talking about expanding U.S. powers and in doing so in a way that doesn't upset or Northerners and Southerners because you're still maintaining the balance. And you got Henry Clay here who doesn't talk about annexing anywhere and talks about tariffs and talks about you know, sensible solutions to, to conflicts. And he talks about, uh, you know, the bank and, and, uh, and things like that, internal improvements. Well, the Americans are going to uh, gravitate, obviously, towards James K. Polk. And in the 1844 election, he's going to win a, a fairly substantial electoral uh, college vote victory over Henry Clay, although the popular vote is somewhat close. So this uh, James K. Polk takes office in 1845. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Before he gets elected, your election's in November 1844. He's not going to take over until March 1845. So there's about a four or five month period before he takes over. Well, he's been saying to everybody, first thing I get in, I'm going to annex Texas. I don't care how I'm going to do it, but I'll get it past the Senate uh, and, and we're going to bring it in. Well, this is going to, uh, oh, by the way, right as he gets, after he gets elected, 
Uh, this is when Andrew Jackson dies. So we're going to stop seeing Jackson pulling the strings for the Democratic Party. And as we're going to talk about, we'll see the Democratic Party, which essentially had been the party of Jackson, start going in a different direction uh, very soon here. All right. So James K. Polk is set to annex Texas in uh, when he gets into office in March 1845. Before he can do that, John Tyler is going to decide, I don't want to leave the presidency without having done something. The American public just elected James K. Polk on the idea of getting Texas, so I'm going to be the one to do it. So what he's going to do is go before Congress, and he's going to say, forget about making a treaty with the Republic of Texas. We're never going to get two-thirds of the vote. Northerners aren't going to agree to it probably. So uh, what I want to do is get it in now. So he's going to call on Congress to make a joint resolution to annex Texas. What is a joint resolution? It's just an agreement by Congress to do something. It's something that so you can essentially compare it to a law. This is what Congress feels the United States should do. And so to do that, you just need a simple majority of both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And he's going to say, we should just pass this, agree to annex Texas, uh, but we should ignore the fact that it is a foreign country. We recognize it as a foreign country, and therefore we should need a treaty, but just go ahead and overlook this, guys, and annex Texas as just pretend. Basically, Congress will agree to annex it without, uh, you know, as if it was already a part of the United States. Well, this joint resolution is going to be incredibly controversial because pe people are going to look at it and say, this isn't the way we're supposed to do things. We obviously recognize Texas is a foreign country, and there'll be a huge protest over this, but it passes both houses, and this joint resolution to annex Texas will pass in March 1845, uh, paving the road for Texas to come into the Union. Um, basically, when this happens, uh, John, uh, uh, John Quincy Adams, at this point, he'd retired from the presidency. He'd taken over uh, as one of the seats of, uh, in the House of Representatives for Massachusetts. He says this is like treating the Constitution like it's a menstruous rag, okay? This is obviously not legitimate because um, the Senate didn't agree to it, but what are you going to do? I mean, at, at this point... It's, it's passed through and people make of the Constitution what they will. So his objections are over uh, overlooked. And this joint resolution, again, a simple majority of both houses uh, will call for annexing Texas. Well, uh, after the joint resolution goes through, the United States will propose to annex Texas under certain conditions. People of Texas are going to have to vote whether they're going to accept these conditions. And the conditions uh, that are going to be set forth with the annexation are going to be one, that Texas would enter the Union as a state, not a territory. So basically they're going to say, uh, we were, we're just going to skip past where you're a territory. We're going to make you a full state. So as we've talked about before, um, you if you have 5,000 people in your territory, 60,000, you're going to become a state. Well, Texas, at this point, the population already grown to over 100,000. And so they're going to say, we're just going to bring you in as a state. Okay. Now, you'll be a single state now. But in the future, you could be broken up into five separate states. That's a condition put forth by the United States um, in, in its deal to annex Texas. Texas will have to keep its public debt, all right? So this is um, uh, one of the, the conditions. So you're going to have to keep your public debt, pay off the money you borrowed, which is pretty substantial because Texas owes a lot of money. But to help Texas in this matter, the uh, Texas government will get to keep its public lands. So any lands that aren't already sold to somebody or don't belong to a, a, a Indian group by recognized treaty, then the Texas government can sell those to private individuals, and it can use that to pay its debt. Um, so this is kind of interesting because if you ever look at a map of federally owned land, the only land you're going to see is a handful of forts because basically the United States is going to take a tiny portion of uh, Texas's land uh, you know, it's, it's Texas's old forts. The United States government will take over those forts uh, and station U.S. troops there. So you turn over your forts um, and you turn over like your armories, that type of thing uh, to the United States government. But you keep the rest of your land. 
All right. Uh, United States is part of this annexing Texas deal. We'll say the U.S. government is going to settle the border dispute with Mexico. So we're going to get Mexico to recognize the Rio Grande as the, the southern border. Um, now, they propose this to Texas. One thing they do not put in this proposal is that Texas can leave the union if it wants. That's not anywhere in this agreement. Uh, I don't know where people come up with that, but it's not true. I mean, obviously, the Civil War is going to later solve that dispute anyway, but that's not part of the agreement. I, I really don't know where people get that. But Texas, if you want to come in the United States, you come in as a state. We, You or us can later divide it into five separate states. You have... Um, uh, uh, or the United States government can divide it into five separate states. You keep your public debt, but you also keep your public lands. You can sell your lands to pay off your debt, and we're going to be the one to take care of um, take care of the issue with Mexico. So John Tyler actually does get this done. I think uh, the final vote is officially at the end of uh, February, but John Tyler puts all the all, everything in motion at the beginning of uh, March 1845. Uh, again, John Quincy Adams objects to it. So when Polk gets in, essentially, he's already got the Texas annexation handed to him. All right. So what's Polk going to do then? Well, he's obviously got to get Mexico to recognize Texas, but he's also got to fulfill his other promises. So as we mentioned, he had been saying 54, 40 or fight for this Oregon territory that Britain and the United States are both claiming this region, both jointly occupying it. Polk said, if I get into office, I'm going to basically take this to the United States all the way up to Alaska. I don't care if it means war with the British. Well, as we all know, when a lot of politicians will promise things during their campaign that they don't ever have any you know, re reality or, of doing, okay? That's what's going to happen with Polk. Basically, he's going to look at this and say, we don't need above this line right here. Why don't we just draw the line right across that we already drew before with the British? And he's going to send this guy, James Buchanan, as a diplomat to Britain and say, dudes, I was just saying that BS 5449er fight to get voted in. A lot of these idiots will buy up anything if I say I'm going to fight stuff. But we do want a, a solution to the Oregon Territory. We can't keep um, jointly occupying it. And so the British and the United States will basically agree, all right, we're just going to draw this line across and, and make this Oregon Territory the United States, and everything north of it will be British territory. So they settle the Oregon dispute with um, uh, Britain very peacefully, all right? It just makes a common sense solution. So you've gotten Britain to recognize this. You've gotten Texas kind of annexed, although you haven't gotten Mex Mexican rec uh, recognition yet. Uh, and you still haven't gotten California, which also uh, Polk wanted to do. So how can we get Mexico to give the United States California and to recognize these borders? Well, again, Polk had been threatening to fight Mexico uh, for, for California and the Rio Grande boundary. Instead, he's going to, once again, try to take a peaceful solution. He will send this guy, John Slidell to Mexico with 25 million in cash. It's not really, he's not really sending him with the money, but for uh, entertainment's sake, imagine John Slidell, Polk's diplomat, carrying a case of 25 million bucks, crossing, uh, or I guess taking a ship down to Mexico City and showing up in Mexico City. And Slidell is going to be there to offer the Mexican government 25 million for California in recognition of the Rio Grande borders of Texas. So essentially, we want to buy this area here. Well, Slidell will get to Mexico. He makes his intentions known. I'm from the United States, and I want to make this offer. No one will meet with him. Not No Mexican officials will even meet with him. Um, by this point, Santa Ana had been thrown out of office because we keep having this constant turnover of government. You know, um, and then people are upset with him about what happened in the Texas Revolution. So he's not there, but the sitting pre president of Mexico doesn't want to meet with him. No Mexican congressman wants to meet with him. So think about John Slidell walking around with his suitcase full of money uh, and nobody will even discuss with him. Why is that the case? Why can't he even, why is Mexico not going to uh, discuss it? Well, you might be thinking 
25 million for a lot, a lot of this land, that's not very much money. Well, today it, we would understand it wouldn't be very much money, but if you're looking at it in uh, 1845 when Slidell goes down there, Mexico doesn't have a lot of people in this region. So of the population of Mexico, only 80,000 live in people that would recognize themselves as Mexican lived in this area. A couple thousand in California, maybe 70, well, 80,000 or something in New Mexico. And then people in Texas don't think of themselves as Mexican. So this is maybe 1%, 1% uh, 2% maybe of Mexico's population. So it's not like you're losing a lot of people. So 25 million is a lot of land, but it's not a lot of citizens. And also, this has cost it cost the Spanish government a lot of money, and it's been costing the Mexican government a lot of money because they've been having to send soldiers up here, although they haven't been doing a very good job of it, to protect people up here. And it's been costing a lot of treasury to protect the people up here from Indians, that type of thing. So you'd be not losing that many people, and you'd be losing sort of a sink for money. And this place hasn't been making a lot in mineral wealth for uh, Mexico. Gold had yet to be discovered in California. Uh, and then uh, there was some silver in New Mexico, but not as much as uh, uh, the Mexican government would like. So you're not even getting much money from up here. So sure, you're selling a lot of land, about, about half of Mexico, but there's not a lot in it, at least as Mexico understands in 1845. So it would seem that somebody would at least listen to Slidell's proposal. Maybe, uh, you know, a couple million dollars more and we'll give this stuff to you, but they wouldn't even meet with them. That's because Mexican politicians knew that were so upset with the United States annexing Texas that if any of them met with Slidell, this would get other politicians to basically say, that guy's a traitor. He's a um, He's, he's dealing with the great northern devil uh, to give up more territory, and whoever the politician was would be thrown out of office. Again, Mexican politics at the time, you know, you could use violence to overthrow you, uh, whoever you're going against. And basically, anybody that was caught dealing with the United States could be regarded as a traitor. And so no, every politician knows it's going to be political suicide if you even negotiate with the United States. So nobody meets with Slidell. He wanders around Mexico. Eventually, he's going to have to come back and say to um, uh, Polk, they wouldn't talk to me about it. You know, I offered the money. Nobody would even consider the offer. So, um, you know, it's, it's not happening. So James K. Polk is now in the situation where he hasn't fulfilled his promise to get Mexico to recognize his border. He hasn't gotten California. So he's going to be looking at this situation. Well, what can I do? If they, they won't even meet with me, how do I get this area? Well, something we won't get to talk about much, but he's going to send John C. Fremont to California, and he's going to say, play the Texas game. He's going to say a handful of American miners had moved out here, and basically he's going to tell Fremont to start a rebellion in California like the Texans did here and then declare California as its own republic. And once that happens, we can just annex California like we annex Texas. All right, so that'll get California in for us. What do we get do about the southern border of the uh, Rio Grande? Now, by this point, Mexico, a lot of politicians were coming to the reality that you're not getting this area that was traditionally Texas back. It's just not happening. But no Mexican politician was willing to recognize this disputed area, this disputed area that had never been part of Texas until the Treaty of Velasco. So this area wasn't uh, as much of a contention between Mexico and the United States as this region. Nobody wanted to recognize this region. And some people in Texas even said, I don't know, that's that's never really been a part of Texas. So I don't know if we should should continue to claim that. So you had this area that was disputed by both territories. Well, Polk is going to take advantage of this dispute by ordering this American general, a guy named Zachary Taylor, to go occupy this disputed territory, okay? Just go down here, park with American forces, and then just wait. So Mexico thinks this is their area. Uh, we think it's ours. If you go here, you're probably going to get attacked. 
uh, Zachary Taylor. He, he didn't actually like choosing Zachary Taylor to do this because Zachary Taylor was a prominent, I shouldn't say he was a prominent Whig. He had been uh, negotiating with the Whig party. So, you know, um, James K. Polk's a Democrat, and he knew if Taylor goes down there and gets credit, it would make him look good um, to the Whigs and to the American public. But Taylor's a really good general. They called him rough and ready. He didn't, you know, his uniform was always, uh, you know, unkempt. But the guy knew how to lead men, and his men were very faithful to him. So he knew if somebody could do this, it's going to be this Taylor guy. Well, Zachary Taylor will take a portion of the American army, and he's just going to park down here uh, in this region. Well, Taylor's forces will come here, and he's going to send out these patrols to go up and down the disputed territory. And, of course, if Mexico thinks this is their land, they have their own patrols here. They see American patrol. One Mexican tr patrol attacks an American patrol, kills a number of soldiers, and these soldiers are then going to uh, make their way back to their camp, inform Taylor what had happened, and Taylor's going to send word back to Polk about these American soldiers being attacked. Well, Polk, as you can imagine, is going to try to go before Congress, or is going to go before Congress and say, American blood has been shed on American soil. Mexico, of course, would say American blood has been shed on Mexican soil, but Polk's trying to sell this war uh, to the United States. Uh, you know, because he wants to go to war to, to get these boundaries in California. So um, he makes this announcement. Some congressmen are going to go along with it. Yeah, well, shit, we got to kill Mexico. They they attacked our soldiers. Some people like this loser House Representatives member, this new guy that just got into elected the House Representative for uh, Illinois, this Abraham Lincoln guy says, oh, wait a minute. You know, where is this? You know, we have a dispute down there with them. They think this is their land, so we can't go to war with this. Guys? Guys? And Lincoln is going to be looked at as this idiot, you know, like, uh, um, forget him, this young uh, House representative member, and Congress will declare war in spite of uh, protests like that. So what this is going to do is now Polk will get an increase in funding for the Army, and he's going to be able to send additional soldiers down here to Zachary Taylor, and you'll see him give Zachary Taylor orders to invade Mexico and force them to recognize the Rio Grande border and force them to give up California and New Mexico. So this is going to be a really big thing in Mexico today because a lot of people in Mexico look at it as, you know, this is stealing Mexican territory. And it, it is. I mean, Mexico is not necessarily using it because there's uh, not many people up here, but it is a uh, sneaky way uh, to get this land. So the American army will start uh, getting called up. They'll call for volunteers. And you're going to have these uh, men start assembling under Zachary Taylor to invade uh, Mexico. Um, so April 1846 is when the um, uh, uh, when the uh, attack on Taylor occurs. May 13th, 1846 is when the U.S.-Mexico War begins. Before we talk about this war... Some people mistake the Texas Revolution and the U.S.-Mexico War. The Texas Revolution is just the, these Americans and Tejanos in 1835 and 1836 defending against Mexico. The U.S.-Mexico War is from 1846 to 1848. This is the United States invading Mexico, trying to get Mexico to recognize uh, Texas independence. Two completely different conflicts. Two completely different conflicts. I mean, they similar disputes in them, but uh, uh, one is a handful of people defending against Mexico. The other is this whole nation invading Mexico. Well, knowing the various issues Mexico has, you would think that Mexico's at a disadvantage here. They are kind of. The United States is way more industrial than Mexico. Mexico has finally gotten Spain to recognize their independence, but their industry is just getting started. Uh, so the United States cannons are way better than Mexican cannons. The U.S. has these rifles, technology on its side that Mexico doesn't have. A lot of other problems Mexico has is a lot of people up here don't really identify with the new nation. Like a lot of people in New Mexico, they haven't gotten a lot of support from the government because uh, the government's down here. People are fighting each other, things like that. 
Um, and so people up here, hey, you haven't been properly protecting us against Indians. Maybe these guys over here would do a better job. So I got that. Mexico also has this political infighting. How can you fight the United States effectively if you've got people down here, Federalists fighting centralist? So they've got that going against them. The few things that Mexico does have going against them is, one, they got more experience fighting. The U.S. hasn't been in a war since the War of 1812. A lot of its soldiers don't have battlefield experience. Mexico, from all its civil wars, tons of experience. The other thing Mexico has going for it is that the war is going to be fought on Mexican soil. The United States has to invade Mexico to get it to give up land. And so this means, you know, you're going to be able to ambush that type of thing. So each side has advantages and disadvantages um, uh, when this war starts. But as we're going to see, the U.S. advantages will outweigh those of Mexico because uh, Taylor will start moving down this direction uh, right after war is declared. And right as he's moving this direction, a different army will come over here to New Mexico. This army is actually going to take over New Mexico uh, fairly easily um, because people of New Mexico, I don't really care about Mexico that much. They're not doing that much for me. Uh, and so there's not going to be much fighting here in New Mexico. And then this U.S. Army is going to move out here to California, where for a very short time, uh, some Americans in California had claimed this Republic of California. So let me let me say this. The Texas Republic was kind of weak, not didn't last very long, was begging the United States to get in. But it was, it did survive for a couple years on its own. California, you know, wasn't really, it was independent for like a month. It's, if anybody says a Republic of California or whatever, not really, okay? Um, but U.S. is going to move out here, have a fairly easy time taking California. So this area up here, because there's not a lot of people who are willing to fight with Mexico and because Mexico didn't have a lot of troops up here, the U.S. takes this area fairly easily. Now, it's going to be more difficult down here with uh, Zachary Taylor um, taking uh, this area in northern Mexico. Um, but because of the advantages the uh, U.S. Army is going to have, they uh, will manage to surround Mexico. The U.S. has this artillery that they can move around on horses. They'll be able to uh, surround Mexican Army there in northern Mexico, defeat them in a number of battles uh, in southern, uh, what's today, southern Texas. Uh, just across the border in what's today northern Mexico. They move on Monterey. It's this old city that the Spanish had had since the 1500s in the silver mining area. Tons of fighting in Monterey. It's this, you know, old stone city, adobe city. Americans have to, you know, kick down doors. Mexicans are going to be firing sniper fire on the Americans. Really bloody battle. Eventually, Zachary Taylor and the Americans are going to merge victorious uh, in the Battle of Monterey. And it looks like Zachary Taylor is set to march straight down to Mexico City and by uh, and possibly arrive there by the end of 1846. The U.S.-Mexico War might not even uh, last a year. But before he's able to head off to Mexico City, he's going to receive a telegram and this new technology that can pass this information across these uh, sound-powered wires. This telegram is going to arrive saying uh, from James K. Polk saying, stop, hold your position in northern Mexico. Taylor's going to be, why? I'm, I'm on my way down there. Why, why can't I just take Mexico City? Well, the problem is that Polk doesn't want Taylor to get credit for winning this war because he thinks that Taylor would win the election in 1848 if he decided to run for the Whigs. Polk, being a Democrat, is going to decide to essentially hurt the cause of the war uh, because he doesn't want a Whig to get elected. Now, Polk's himself not going to run in 1848, but he wants his fellow Democrats to win. So he says, hold off, Taylor. I'm going to get somebody else to take Mexico City. Um what he's going to do, well, actually, uh, he's going to do is he's going to get this guy, Winfield Scott, who's also actually a Whig. Um, he's going to put him in charge of putting together a naval expedition to land on the coast of Mexico to take Mexico City. Uh, now, he has to choose a Whig. He doesn't want to give Winfield Scott credit uh, for this either because he don't want Scott running for president. 
uh, but there's no qualified Democrat generals to take this over. So he's basically thinking, if I get one Whig, uh, Taylor, getting a little bit of credit, a little bit of credit to Scott, it'll divide the credit up so the Whigs won't have a strong credit. And again, if you think back um, to Jackson, he'd been running on his military resume. Harrison had won on his military resume. He doesn't want to give a resume to these Whigs. So just kind of divide the credit up amongst them. Um, actually, Polk tried to, um, just as he's sending Scott, he tried to actually end the, the war peacefully uh, by give, bribing Santa Ana. He gave money to Santa Ana with the idea that uh, Santa Ana is in Cuba at the time. He says, hey, here's some money. You take over, uh, return to Mexico, try to take over the government of Mexico, and then once you do, get get the government to recognize that California and Texas are gone. Santa Ana accepts this bribe from the United States. He's going to then land in Mexico, but then he's going to basically say, uh, you know what, forget the United States. I'm going to help you guys fight, and, uh, and Santa Ana will start this defense against the U.S. here in Mexico. So Polk kind of messes up in, in uh, trusting Santa Ana to do these things. All right, so Winfield Scott, he will take his army, and he's going to land here in Mexico City. Taylor's just sort of chilling out here. He can't really do anything about about the situation because Polk told him to halt. Um, uh, Winfield Scott uh, lands his forces. A lot of Americans get sick. The coast of Mexico, especially during this time, really disease-ridden. A lot of mosquitoes. Uh, yellow fever's prominent. A lot of Americans get sick. But still, because Mexican forces are divided, a lot of people in Mexico don't uh, supported Santa Ana, but a lot didn't. A lot didn't even want to fight for this guy. Uh, and so uh, as Winfield Scott forces march to Mexico City, they'll actually get help from Santa Ana's political uh, opponents. They'll tell them, hey, Santa Ana's setting up an ambush uh, on the other side of this mountain. That's what happens at this Battle of Cerro Gordo. The Americans are trying to pass towards Mexico City. Santa Ana's waiting on the other side of a ridge. Uh, one of Santa Ana's political opponents says, these guys are waiting over here. Americans come up, surround them from the other side, and use their uh, long-range cannons to, to uh, force Santa Ana's forces uh, to retreat. Eventually, Santa Ana's going to realize, I can't defend this place. He tries to run off, start an insurgency. He barely actually avoids capture by the American forces. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he does run away leaves uh, Mexico City open to the United States, and the U.S. Army will enter Mexico City uh, in 1847, capturing Mexico. Well, the problem is, when Winfield Scott gets there, Santa Ana's gone, and so are other Mexican pro uh, politicians. They, they had uh, run before you know the United States forces arrived, so Winfield Scott's going to be sitting here, well, what do I do now? Well, James K. Polk will send a guy, um, a guy named uh, 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 not Nicholas Slidell. Um, um, hold on one second. Nicholas Trist. Okay, uh, Nicholas Trist. He's going to send him to Mexico City, and uh, he's going to say, find somebody to settle this dispute, and he's going to tell him to make sure you get California. And you get Texas. Well, actually, after shortly after he sends Nicholas Trist to Mexico City, Polk will say, you know what? We actually want more than that. He's going to say, why don't you take this northern half of Mexico? And there's going to be discussion in Polk's cabinet of taking all of Mexico. Eventually, that's going to be talked down because a lot of people uh, don't like the idea of um, bringing in this, these indigenous people and these Catholics into the United States. It's okay if we take this area up here because there's only 1% of the population. There's not as many Catholics we're going to be taking in, not, not as many people with indigenous ancestry in here uh, as there is down here. So um, uh, we don't want this area because it will cause racial issues and it will cause uh, religious issues. But they do say to Tris, take this northern half. Well, Tris gets down there. He can't find anybody to negotiate with. Eventually, he's going to find some Mexican politicians. Um, but when he starts negotiating with them, they're going to be refusing to give up what Polk is going to be asking. And at this point, Santa Ana is starting to get this insurgency going, and you'll start seeing American soldiers getting attacked. 
And what I think happens, and I, I, I'm betting a historian has proved this, and I just haven't read it. I think Tristes looks around and says, we're going to get caught in a quagmire here. We better get out of here before, while we can. So he makes this agreement with these uh, Mexican soldiers or these Mexican officials, something called uh, this agreement called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is going to be signed on August 7th. Uh, I'm sorry, not August 7th. Um, he's going to be signed in 1848 between the United States and uh, the Mexican government agreeing to end the war between the U.S. and Mexico. And what this Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo will do is Trist is going to require Mexico to recognize the southern border of Texas as the Rio Grande. He's going to um, uh, he's going to force Mexico to give up California in this area here. Mexican officials are going to refuse to give up Baja of California, Baja California, and then Trist is initially going to try and insist on this area up here, but then. When he sees, you know, hey, this isn't going to happen to Polk, he's going to sort of pull back on that. But the U.S. is still going to get this area that's today Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Nevada. Surrender this, recognize the borders of Texas. So you give all this stuff to us. So Texas is about 300,000 square miles uh, of Texas. And at the time, it's going to go all the way up to here. And this is an additional 500,000 square miles square miles. So Mexico has to give up in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo 800,000 square miles to the United States. Now, Trist doesn't want to make it seem like the U.S. is just taking this from Mexico. So what they're going to say is that um, uh, the Mexico will receive $15 million for this. It's kind of a weird thing. You think about the victorious nation uh, you know, paying the, the nation they defeated money, but the U.S. kind of doesn't want to look like it's taking this from Mexico. You know, Britain's looking at what's happening here. They're kind of upset by it because they uh, don't like the United States getting even more territory. Uh, but again, you know, to sell it as an international thing, we're going to pay you money for it. So um, $15 million. Now, what about the people here that considered themselves Mexican, that were Spanish, uh, consider themselves Spanish, but then Mexicans in independence. They're now Mexican, predominantly here in New Mexico, a handful over here uh, in California. What happens to them? Well, the U.S. is going to say they get to keep their titles to land and they're going to be uh, recognized as Mexican, as American citizens. They basically have the option. They can uh, stay Mexican citizens and they can go to Mexico or they can become American citizens. Um, so this is actually uh, somewhat interesting because uh, in most states in the United States and most territories in the United States don't allow indigenous people to vote. A lot of people here in New Mexico are these pueblos who have now become Hispanicized, speak Spanish, and are Spaniards, but they're full-blooded Indian. There's going to be some disputes when you start seeing the territorial governments formed out here. Do we allow Indians to vote? Because we don't allow Indians to vote in these other areas. So what will eventually be determined when we see these territories formed, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that if you have one drop of European blood, so if you're a tiny bit Spaniard, you can vote in these uh, elections, which actually juxtaposes most southern states had put this one drop African rule that anybody with African ancestry, one drop, cannot vote. But when these territories are formed, it'll be anybody with one drop European uh, uh, blood can vote out here. Kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about, but it's going to be a, an, an issue later on. All right. So um, now we have this new territory. Uh, this is going to be a major issue at the time because, sure, we got some new northern territory, but we've got a lot of territory that could possibly become slave states, bringing this slave debate to the table yet again. So what? how is the United States going to address this? Well, it looks like, uh, oh, by the way, one other thing that's kind of interesting about um, the citizens out here, this is a, uh, a fairly controversial absolute vodka ad. I believe it was from like 97, something like that. Uh, it, 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 uh, basically a hypothetical world if the U.S.-Mexico war hadn't happened, 
Uh, this was still part of Mexico. This was run in a, uh, 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 I think, a magazine that catered to a Spanish-speaking audience. And uh, this is kind of encapsulates the feelings that some people are, have because some people here in New Mexico didn't want to become part of the United States. And we're later going to see some civil rights issues where uh, people uh, from Mexico or people of Mexican ancestry say, you know, we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird situation uh, for, for some of these Mexican citizens to be in. But again, the probably the biggest thing to come out of this is going to be it's going to bring the slavery debate up to the table once again, because now we have to decide what to do about all this new territory. Do we allow slavery in it or not? Zachary Taylor will end up being the one to be in a position to settle the slavery dispute in the West because in 1848, he's going to be elected president of the United States. You don't have to worry about the election of 1848. Just know that Henry Clay is going to think that he's going to run again. At this point, he's lost 1824 election, um, 1832 election. Uh, he's lost then uh, just now the 1844 election. Um, well, he's going to want to run again for the Whigs. Um, but the Whigs are going to say, dude, you've already lost three times. We need somebody that's going to win. Um, and so they're going to put up Zachary Taylor, not because he's interested in politics. He doesn't care about politics. As a matter of fact, when uh, the Whigs select him, they say, well, what are your political leanings? I don't know. Uh, do you believe in the American system? Do you want to promote the tariff, infrastructure, that kind of thing? Um, the National Bank, Taylor will say, I don't know, I guess. He really doesn't have as much opinion. He really says he never votes. But the Whigs say he's a general. He's a hero of the U.S.-Mexico War. He's electable, so let's throw him on the ticket. Now, the Democrats, they're in a very unusual position because uh, James K. Polk doesn't want to run again. He says, I just want to run for one term. I got what I want done. I don't need to run again. So the Democrats are going to look around and they're going to say, well, what are we? This is the first election they have where Jackson has died. Remember, Jackson created the Democratic Party around himself. He had endorsed, uh, again, Martin Van Buren to take over after him, but then he'd abandoned Martin Van Buren because he didn't want to annex Texas, and he'd endorsed James K. Polk. But now Polk's gone. Jackson's gone. What do we stand for? Well, the Democrats aren't going to know just yet. But what you'll actually see is more Democrats at this time are from the South than they are from the North because Jackson has more support in the South. So some Democrats are going to be looking at these territories in the West and some will start saying, maybe we need to push for our party to be this party of slavery's expansion or Southern rights. And some more and more Southerners have become concerned about this Northern interest in ending slavery, which is not very prominent as we're going to talk about. But some Southerners think Northerners want to end slavery. So at the Democratic convention where they're choosing their candidate, they're going to end up picking this guy, Lewis Cass. He basically is going to say, I'm going to be pushing for um, slavery's expansion into the West and non-government interference in slavery. And he's actually at the convention uh, uh, running against Martin Van Buren. So Van Buren wants to get the, the nomination he didn't get in 1844, wants to get in 1848. He's from the North. He hears what happens with the Democratic Party. And he says, what are we talking about? You know, slavery. That's not what we're about. Well, what are we about? We're about Jackson. Well, Jackson's dead. So Martin Van Buren sees this Democratic Party turning to this sort of Southern Rights Party, and he's going to end up walking out of the convention. He goes on and forms his own party. They're not going to do very well. Cass doesn't do well because American public is going to look at Zachary Taylor and basically say, you know, this guy here of the U.S.-Mexico War, he'll be elected, and it's going to be up to him to have to deal with the problems that are going to come from this expansion in the West.